Good afternoon and welcome to a new virtual investment summit by Fan Society. Today we're going to talk about US politics and specifically about US policies in the first 100 days of Joe Biden's administration. To do so, uh, we have the pleasure to count with the sponsorship of MFS, Investment Management and Capital Group, and also with a very special guest as moderator. But first, let me remind you that uh, there will be a Q&A session after the panel and you can introduce your questions in the WebEx app um, throughout all the discussion and we will um, ask the questions to the panelists at the end of the program. And now I want to introduce um, Ahmed Riesgo. Ahmed Riesgo, he's Chief Investment Strategist at Insignial. He has been working for the firm for over 12 years. Before that, he worked at Credit Suisse. He's uh, an economist and a lawyer. And uh, um, I think it was like eight months ago, we were uh, talking in another virtual investment summit about the elections, about what was going to happen. Um, and I know you love uh, talking about politics and their effect on the economy. So the floor is yours. Please introduce our guests and let's, let's do this. Great. Well, thank you, Alicia. And thank you, Fund Society, for putting this together. Uh, indeed, a few months ago, we were in this very forum talking about the election. Hopefully today we're going to get a little bit better snapshot of what's been going on in the Biden administration at, as we reach the seminal point of the first 100 days. So to join me are John Emerson from Capital Group, who's the vice chairman there, also former ambassador to Germany, um, also well connected among democratic circles for a long time. So John, thank you for joining us. And also Rob Almeida from, from MFS, he's our chief investment strategist. So Rob will be joining us when we start discussing some of the investment implications from the Biden administration. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Great okay, to John, be here. So let's, th great. Thank you, John, for joining us again here. So, John, so um, Biden has, uh, from what I've heard, a portrait of Franklin Roosevelt over the Resolute desk, right? So that always tells you what some of the ambitions are. So uh, considering everything that's happened in the first 100 days, how would you rate the Biden administration so far? Well, I think on... Uh, if, if you grade them on the two things he said he needed to do in the first 100 days, I'd, I'd rate them as an A. I mean, first and foremost, what he uh, said he needed to do was get on top of the COVID uh, disease, the whole progress of COVID throughout the United States. And then secondly, uh, get vaccines out and disseminated and into the arms of American citizens. And we are now at a point where our COVID numbers are going down dramatically. Uh, I mean, my, I'm actually joining you here from Berlin, Germany, but my home state of California, which used to be one of the worst states in the country, is now one of the best states in the country. Um, uh, no deaths in the last few days and very, very small ratio of people actually getting affected. Uh, and in terms of vaccinations, we've had over 220 million Americans uh, have had at least one jab and about a third of the country has uh, been fully vaccinated. So, I mean, those are actually remarkable numbers. The second thing he said he wanted to do was first stabilize the economy and then uh, really stimulate the economy. And he called it build back better, but create uh, uh, new jobs, long, long term jobs and uh, and really um, create an economy that works much better for the middle class. That piece is sort of what's going to happen in the next hundred days, he hopes. Uh, but in terms of stabilizing the economy, the big package there was a $1.9 trillion uh, uh, investment uh, paid for with deficit spending, basically, uh, to put money in the hands of people, help keep them in their houses, keep food on their tables, uh, help small businesses from going out of business, provide more, not, not just direct loans to people or direct grants to people, but also increase uh, unemployment insurance benefits uh, to help individuals. Every penny of that, even though it's not stimulus per se, it was more stabilization or COVID relief as they called it, but every penny of that goes back into the real economy. We've already seen some of the numbers about you know, first quarter growth of the U.S. economy where uh, where that seems to have had an effect. So I'd give them pretty high marks at this point. Now, and for sure, the economic numbers are coming in quite, quite strong and the progress on the pandemic is going great. Let me ask you this. Um, 
the last I checked YouGov, his approval rating was just north of 50%, 51% last I checked. Um, higher than Trump's, obviously, but much lower than Barack Obama's. Um, is this merely a case of polarization in the United States, making it impossible for a president to really have high approval ratings? Or is there something else going on? I, I honestly think it's polarization, because if you look at the policies that he's uh, promoting, they actually get much higher support. Uh, you know, the COVID relief package had about 65 percent uh, approval or support. Um, the policies that uh, are in the next two packages that he's presenting to Congress for economic stimulus get uh, over 60 percent uh, approval rating or support. But you have a, a president who, um, you know, and a Republican Party led by still, believe it or not, Donald Trump, who keeps saying uh, that uh, Joe Biden was not legitimately elected, that the election was fraud, that it was stolen by or stolen from Donald Trump. You still have a majority of Republican uh, voters who believe that. And um, and so they're not going to give approval to this guy who uh, uh, they think um, stole the election. So I, I honestly do think that this sort of continuation of what Liz Cheney, the number three Republican in the House of Representatives, calls the big lie. Um, but the continued repetition of that probably has had an impact. And you may be right, too, Ackman, that we're now at a point where the country continues to be so divided and polarized. It's going to be hard for any president of one of the other parties to um, get much above, uh, say, 55 percent in approval rating. Yeah, this seems to be a structural trend, a trend now occurring, uh, really, if you look past, you know, more than 10 years. Let me ask you this. Uh, his speech last week to Congress, uh, it seemed to me that it was sort of more tailored around policy rather than this sort of sweeping ideological um, use of words, let's say, that even Barack Obama and even George Bush did before. So this seems to be a president much more focused on policy and trying to drive home policy. Do you think this is a consequence of his lower approval ratings, let's say? No, I think it's more a consequence of how he sees the world. You know, Joe Biden is a uh, more of a prag he's a pragmatist. He's not an inspirational speaker. He, I, I think he tried to do that back when he ran for president in 1988. That didn't work out too well for him. So he's he's much more of a, of a pragmatist. And I think, again, Ide ideology invites polarization. But if you sell your agenda uh, by talking about the specifics of the programs that are generally pretty popular, then maybe you can uh, you can get more done. And I think that's what they're doing. I think it's actually a pretty shrewd move. If he spoke and if he talked about being a sweeping FDR style president, I think that would backfire. But if he talks about, hey, I'm going to do this for working families, I'm going to do this for kids in school, I'm going to do this for your broadband access in rural America, even if people maybe aren't Democrats or they think Joe Biden isn't there, they might say, well, actually, I kind of like that. And uh, and so I think it's a smart approach to present to a Congress that he needs uh, to help get uh, these policies implemented. OK, and I think that this is going to be relevant for us for what comes next, because like you said, the fiscal stimulus bill that already passed. What's next on the agenda are the American jobs plan and the American families plan. Let's take a look at both plans now with you. What do you think are the most what is the most likely outcome for both uh, for passage? Will they pass in their entirety? Will they pass in some semblance? Uh, timing? Let's dive a little bit into the details. Let's start first with the the one that I think that there's more support for and that there's a perhaps a higher probability for, which is the American jobs plan, the infrastructure. plan. Yeah, you're, and, you're, and you're dead right about that. The American jobs plan is not only about jobs for middle class Americans, but it's doing it with what people see as sort of traditional infrastructure, you know, building money for building roads, bridges, buildings, light rail systems, port expansions, airport expansions, that kind of thing. Plus, uh, there are several hundred billion dollars in there for broadband access. And the, the broadband access issue is uh, that kind of infrastructure is really important. Uh, there are all sorts of stories of families, particularly in rural America, having to load their families or their kids into the minivan or the truck, drive to the public library miles away from their house and sit in the parking lot so that their kids could attend school by accessing the Wi-Fi 
from that public library. I mean, that's just ridiculous. And you have the same problem in some parts of the uh, inner city as well. So I think there, there are items in this package that should be uh, pretty popular throughout the country. The other thing about it, and, and not to sound cynical, but uh, both the House and the Senate have brought back earmarking. Earmarking is a concept where in a piece of legislation, uh, a senator or a congressman can actually put a specific project in that piece of legislation, earmark the money to go to building X or bridge Y. And the reason that's going to be helpful, I think, in terms of getting something passed, maybe not as big as what the president wants, but something passed, um, and probably with some Republican votes as well, is that, um, you know, you can always, I don't want to sound cynical, but buy votes in effect by uh, including for a particular senator or a particular member of Congress, a very uh, important project or a special project in their district that they want or in their state that they want. And um, so I think there's a lot more room to maneuver on that piece. When you get to the families uh, plan, uh, you know, the Republicans are saying, well, that's basically Democratic um, I, goals and objectives masquerading as jobs or masquerading as infrastructure. Well, you know, the by President Biden saying, well, actually, it's not. It's they're necessary. Child care, for instance, or, you know, free preschool or free uh, community college for high school graduates. Those are essential for rebuilding the American economy and for helping middle class uh, workers uh, of both today and tomorrow uh, to develop the skills needed to get the jobs of today and tomorrow. And so you know, they they have that sort of uh, uh, semantic argument going on. But my sense is that that part of it is probably more likely to be passed through another reconciliation package. And the part that pertains to uh, basic nuts and bolts, brick and mortar infrastructure is something that would more likely be able to be done with uh, some uh, support of Republicans as well as Democrats uh, in Congress. The big question on both of these is how you're going to pay for them. And, um, you know, the president has proposed uh, increasing the corporate tax uh, from 21 percent to 25, uh, 20, I'm sorry, 28 percent. Remember, it used to be 35 percent before the Trump tax cut brought it down to 21 percent back in 2017. Um, but Biden wants to kick that up by seven points. I think they probably end up somewhere around 24 or 25 percent. So it's a bump in the corporate tax. But then the family plan he is hoping to pay for by uh, increasing taxes on wealthy Americans. And the, the big headline grabber there is not so much the highest individual rate goes back up to where it was under Presidents Bush and President Obama, uh, but it go but the capital gains tax gets doubled for any income earners who, who earn more than a million dollars a year. That's a big bump uh, in the capital gains tax. And my guess is you'll get some pushback in Congress from that. And my guess is also you won't get a single Republican vote for a package that has that kind of tax hike in it, which is why I suggest that that part of the economic stimulus package, the, the more the family plan, is something that's more likely to go through with reconciliation with uh, 50 Democratic votes assuming he can get the moderate Democrats on board with that as well. And that, that's not an insignificant assumption. I was just going to say, it's not just on the Republican side there. We know Joe Manchin, for example, out of West Virginia, has been a vocal proponent of not increasing the capital gains tax or the corporate tax rate. So it seems that something does get passed, even with reconciliation, it's likely to be uh, more moderate. John, I think this, uh, uh, Rob, sorry, I think this is a good time to switch over to you we talked a little bit about the American Jobs Plan and the, and the Families Plan with John. Uh, let's get now from your perspective, from an investment perspective, how are you handicapping the, the probabilities of both plans passing? Let's first deal with the sort of the demand side of the equation first, right? The infrastructure, and then we'll talk about the tax implications afterwards. Sure. Um, well, I think, at least how I think about it at its simplest level, GDP is a flow but the equity market is a, is a stock of wealth. And so while they're interlinked, they're actually two really materially uh, different things. And so I think the uh, plans being put in place will certainly be economically accretive over the long term. They'll be accretive to uh, inflation, 
But what the market is more focused on is in the near term, uh, what will profits be? And so when I, I think through um, the potential stimulus packages to come, but also what has already occurred, uh, none of that really addresses what have been the longer term uh, secular forces that created this stagnating environment that we've lived in uh, in the post-global financial crisis era. So it was too much debt, whether at the public sector level or at the private sector level, not households, but corporations. Debt is calcifying. And so that problem has now been made worse. Right. Obviously, uh, we had a tremendous amount of debt issuance. It actually was close to around $25 trillion uh, over the last 15 months. So there's, there's more debt on balance sheets today, which crowds out uh, private investment and dampens money velocity. Uh, demographics, demographics are worse, not better. And then there's technology and digitalization, which is disinflationary. And so clearly the markets have pulled forward uh, the economic strength that we're seeing now, markets have pulled forward, uh, which is what they care about most, the tremendous uh, profit rebound. I mean, profits look like they're going to be up 40%, which is just remarkable. So I, I think all of this is largely in the price. And I think what you're seeing now, particularly today, but over the last several weeks, is the market digesting what's next. So what what do financial conditions and profits look like in 2022, 2023, 2024, and beyond? So at the end of the day, um, I, I, we don't have the skill set ultimately to handicap what a stimulus package will look like and its probability of passing through. All we can take into consideration is what are the ranges of outcomes? So does this widen the range of, of, of outcomes? And so ultimately, I think all those secular forces they'll come back, the market will be forced to internalize them again. And I guess for our focus, it's really what does a company do? How do they do it? And can they keep doing it in an environment where maybe the cost of labor is higher or taxes are higher? Uh, and of course, there'll be more uh, GDP because of all the things that John talked about. Right. So do you think uh, that at its core, these policies will contribute to uh, perhaps an inflationary spike? on the next year or two? I, I think so. And you're seeing that now. Break-evens in the sovereign bond markets or treasury break-evens are wider. Um, inflation is everywhere but in the numbers, right? It's in lumber prices. It's in food prices. It's in cars. It's in uh, um, rental cars. It's in vacation rentals. It's, it's seemingly everywhere all around us, but it's not in financial markets. Right. It's not in uh, the Treasury bond market outside of break evens. It's not in uh, equity market. So I think uh, how the market's thinking about it is not too different than the Fed, which is uh, all of these catalysts are inflationary, but they're transitory. So ultimately, if you're paying three times more for a piece of plywood to rebuild your shed or a back deck, that ultimately becomes a tax unless you have material income growth or loan growth to offset that. So I think these are inflationary in the near term, but the disinflationary forces that I mentioned earlier, they're just too powerful. And I think they resurge back uh, whenever that is next year or the year after. Okay. And uh, as far as sectors go, um, interestingly, I, let's take clean energy. You saw that sector and, and, and those stocks rise up pretty much until I think towards the end of the year, until like about January or so, even of this year. And then really they've sort of been trending lower um, ever since we've gotten more information of the Biden plans. Do you think that's the case of the market sort of got ahead of itself and thought that, you know, sort of already front loaded those gains? How do you see certain sectors? What winners and losers do you see coming out of the uh, plans coming up? Yeah, so I, I and this is an oversimplification, but I, I think we live in a world more so than ever, and it's exponentially increasing every day of uh, just information democratization, right? So we're made aware of everything worldwide, largely instantaneously. And so what the market is is forced to do is digest all that information and then it prices risk based on what it just heard and i think what's so important 
for every investor, um, particularly those with a, a longer term horizon, is now you have to work harder than you did before to differentiate between what's near term market noise that might be accretive in the short run, but is it really accretive in the long run? So whether it's energy or technology or consumer discretionary or, 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 or staples, I think what's most important is underwriting what does the business do, right? What's their return on capital versus their cost of capital and what's the sustainability of that? And so at the end of the day, what doesn't change is what does a company do? How do they do it? Can it be duplicated? Can it be done by somebody else at a cheaper cost? Can they raise prices in the face of higher input costs, whether it's wages or commodity prices? Do they have the ability to sustain their margins and profits? Because ultimately, that's what uh, the market cares about. So for us, it's less about what sectors will benefit or will be hurt uh, by these uh, policies and it's more about the innards so companies inside that uh, who are the ones that are differentiated they have whether it's brand equity or some sort of intellectual property or service that's unique that's hard to duplicate and what's the sustainability of that and then what's that what are those future cash flows worth excellent so you think uh, we're going into an environment where stock picking matters a lot more than it has in the past. Yes, a lot of people share that view. John, let's turn back to you. Uh, we talked a little bit about Biden's domestic uh, policy. Let's talk about some of his foreign policy um, opportunities as well as possible pitfalls. Well, it uh, two things to look at, or really three. Um, foreign policy in general, uh, trade, and China. And obviously, number two and three are somewhat related. Uh, but in terms of foreign policy in general, the, you, you're seeing with Biden a return to the multilateralism and the commitment to working with our allies that we saw through bipartisan administrations, Democrat and Republican, all the way up to Donald Trump. And since Amer every president takes America first, right? But the Donald Trump version of America first meant America alone, withdrawing from a lot of these multilateral institutions, um, withdrawing from a leadership role, wanting to, uh, and, and by, by the way, the theory of the case, which which you can you know make a good argument around is that, that the United States as an 800 pound gorilla has, uh, wants, doesn't want to be constrained in its uh, uh, range of action. And, and in dealing with uh, other countries. And that was, that was the Trump argument. Uh, the Biden argument is that in point of fact, one of our greatest strengths um, when it comes to negotiating deals, for instance, is the fact that we have values-based alliances and that it's actually worth in the short term giving up some uh, latitude uh, in order to move forward with these larger alliances, particularly when dealing with uh, adversaries like Russia and, and like China. So, you know, so you have these two different approaches. So with Biden, you immediately saw a return to the Paris Climate Change Agreement. You saw a, 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 a strong uh, commitment to uh, NATO. You saw a commitment back to the WTO. You saw a, re, a return to the World Health Organization and a number of the organizations within the, the UN. You see an effort to rejoin the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. But in all of those, uh, it's not just go back to the way it is. It was, all right, we see that there are some problems, but the best way to improve these organizations and their effectiveness is to be actively engaged within them. And so that's what's happening. And Biden's about to take uh, next month his first foreign trip. He goes to the UK for G7 and then immediately to Brussels for a NATO summit. Uh, and, and that'll be his first time uh, overseas. Um, but on trade and on China, what we're seeing is something I think we all thought we talked about several months ago would, would likely happen, which is that the difference between the Biden approach and the Trump approach is much more a difference in degree, not a difference in kind. So, for instance, Biden has not yet taken down any of the tariffs that were imposed by Trump and, in fact, is continuing a much more a protectionist approach, sort of doubling down on the idea of Buy America policies um, in terms of government procurement, as an example. Uh, I know his trade um, 
representative is uh, starting to look at some of the tariffs and try to make a determination uh, which ones are more effective than others, which ones actually are hurting the American consumer uh, more than um, our competitors, and, uh, and, and we'll probably make some recommendations. We'll certainly make some recommendations to the president on the basis of that, but that hasn't happened yet. And on China, uh, you know, we've seen a continuation of, uh, you know, sort of very tough kind of adversarial approach that the Trump administration started with a difference in tone. So Tony Blinken, the uh, new Secretary of State, gave a speech uh, shortly after uh, he was uh, sworn in and took office where he said, look, we're going to work with China where we uh, where we can. Uh, and in areas like uh, climate change, for instance, or nuclear nonproliferation, or even in setting up a system for dealing with future pandemics. So we know on day one what's actually happening in China, as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, finding out, you know, weeks or even months later. So that those areas, we're going to cooperate with China, but we will be adversarial where we must be. And that, you know, uh, would include I issues like Taiwan or the South China Sea or keeping a close eye on. Uh, and fundamentally, we will be competitive with China. We see, uh, we see them as our biggest competitor on a go forward basis. Uh, but being competitive doesn't just mean imposing tariffs. It also means investing in our own infrastructure in terms of training, basic research, education, technology, uh, and that's a part of what Biden has uh, loaded into uh, this build back plan that he has. So so there, there's sort of those three components of China. But many of the policies that Trump put in place uh, are remaining in place. And uh, Tony Blinken also said things we think the previous administration did that were right. We're going to continue uh, things we think they did wrong. We're going to change. And, and you see that uh, really playing out on the foreign policy front. Right. The uh, the historian, the Stanford historian, Neil Ferguson, uh, wrote an article a few weeks ago saying that uh, uh, Taiwan uh, and China could be uh, the U.S.'s Suez crisis. Right. And he was making a reference to the Suez crisis of the 1950s sort of being the um, the marking point for the end of British hegemony in the world, sort of a, like a stark reminder that Britain was not the empire that it once was. He was sort of trying to make the analogy that something similar could happen to the United States, potentially in places like Taiwan. Do you see the chances for something like that occurring over the next couple of years? Well, you know, the Suez crisis, you had the Egyptians literally rise up and uh, take arms against the Brit Brits who were controlling the Suez Canal and throw them out. Uh, we don't have that kind of dynamic with Taiwan. First of all, we politically moved to the you know one China policy where we recognize Beijing. We still have relationships with Taiwan. We still sell them defensive uh, weapons or offensive weapons as well. And uh, uh, but but it is China is Beijing and it's Beijing that's a member of the UN, etc. So um, so the political piece has sort of been set. I guess the question is. Is it in China's interest really to invade Taiwan? Um, I, and I, I don't think so. I mean, to invade and then become an occupying power and, and, and all that, uh, you know, they're certainly flexing their muscles. Uh, they don't want, um, you know, uh, you, you could potentially see uh, the kind of pressure on Taiwan that's being exerted in Hong Kong. Uh, but uh, I do not see us getting into a shooting war with China over Taiwan. I, I would certainly see us doing everything we can to try to uh, deter um, that kind of activity on the part of uh, China. Uh, certainly there would be a huge uprising uh, in the global community. There would be massive economic sanctions, um, boycotts, things like that. If China were to take an action like that, I just don't think it's necessarily in its interest. And of course, China's culture is one that thinks in decades and centuries, not in years or election cycles, the way ours seems to sometime. And so, uh, you know, the gravitational pull, of course, is, uh, you know, Taiwan, you know, ultimately probably getting closer to China. So so I, I, I don't see that happening because I don't see the trigger for uh, that kind of a kinetic response on behalf of, uh, uh, of Beijing. All right. 
Okay, Rob, and let's turn over to you now in terms of the uh, American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan. Both of them have, uh, with, with both proposals, Biden has suggested an increase in the corporate tax rate uh, from 21 to 28%. Both John and I are in full agreement that it's likely to settle somewhere between 24 and 25%. We totally coincide there. And on the capital gain side, um, obviously the increase is up to 39, 40% when you factor in perhaps the, uh, the Obama taxes, but likely to settle somewhere south of 30 would be my guess. How are you uh, accounting for those changes on the uh, tax side, both the capital gains and the corporate tax side in your projections and what you are investing in? Uh, I'll take a reverse order. On the capital gains front, I don't. Um, you know, trying to underwrite what a wealthy investor may or may not do with their capital is just not part of our investment thesis. There are things that you can take into consideration as a material input to come up with a range of probable outcomes for uh, a company's profitability. So as it pertains to looking at the market through that lens, um, that, that's not something, you know, outside of, let's say, the U.S. municipal bond market, where it's an obvious uh, beneficiary of, of that. Um, on the corporate get, on the um, corporate tax side, however, that's very different. So it's looking at not just where tax rates are, but what are companies' effective tax rates. So the part not being discussed is what happens with guilty tax. And so just thinking through, you know, at the end of the day, there's three things um, when you kind of aggregate PE ratios that drive equity valuations. So it's the return on capital of the business. It's the growth rate of those returns. So those returns above average at 11% and going to 12% over time, or is the terminal value uh, more like 6 or 7%, right? So what's the return? What's the, the, the growth rate? And what's the idiosyncratic risk, right? How, how risky is the business? What's their equity beta cost of capital, et cetera? So uh, corporate taxes is a materially uh, is a material input to that. And so factor that in, into um, the investment model. So if a company's paying X and we think they might be playing, uh, paying X plus Y, well, obviously that's gonna change uh, the profit calculus and that's gonna change uh, the multiple that we're willing to pay for that. So that's how we think about it. Okay, so are you guys, uh, let's say, do you have a range of scenarios, let's say the corporate tax rate were to go as high as 28%, which is what Biden wants. Have you factored in what the EPS hit would be if that were the case? And perhaps a more middle of the road scenario, 24 to 25, have you guys factored in an EPS hit for forward guidance? So I've looked at it and just come up with a, a varying range of outcomes. I think it's somewhere between eight to 12% from an earnings standpoint. Um, which is interesting because the market has largely uh, yawned at that, right? So it's just looking at GDP, the strength of near-term earnings, and I don't think it's really factoring in uh, higher tax rates. But I, I think at a broader level, I think what the market is in its, you know, the market is super smart, but it's very, very short term, right? And so um, I think the market gets everything right in the short term and then largely gets those things in the out years wrong. So I think what the market is not taking in consideration, not just higher taxes, because we're gonna have to pay uh, for this pandemic. Um, and I think, but largely the intent of a dis redistribution of wealth. You know, capitalism has left a lot of people behind, particularly uh, in the Milton Friedman uh, shareholder primacy era. And I think as we, shift into a different regime, more of a stakeholder primacy, where uh, companies are forced, whether it's through regulation, but more through behavioral change because their customers are demanding it, because investors are demanding it. I mean, just look at the massive flow into ESG or ESG-related um, portfolios. I think what the world is telling companies is we want change. And you're seeing that just in the number of companies in the last two and three earning seasons that are mentioning corporate social responsibility or any of the uh, 17 UN uh, sustainable development goals. So I think what's happening is because of technology, it's created a world of one, transparency, where we know everything instantaneously, but now you know how something was made Maybe it was made in a way that was environmentally unfriendly. You know how it was made. Maybe it was using un part of the supply chain was unfair labor practices. So you've got not just NGOs, but a large group of customers and investors 
that are maybe shunning the product or shunning the asset because they want change. And now you throw in, how do these things flow through the income statement? So as an investor, that's ultimately what I care about. So whether it's higher taxes, whether it's higher minimum wage, whether it's companies having to reshift supply chains because of, again, unfair labor practices, or they have to, instead of digging a hole here, they're gonna have to dig a hole over here using a different tool that's, again, more in environmentally friendly. All of that is going to be cost accretive. So who's gonna pay for it? Somebody has to pay for it. Either the company pays for it through profits and margin, or they pass that through to the consumer because the product is that good. So ultimately what I care about is all these things matter and corporate taxes are part of that. How will it flow through the income statement? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it ultimately just still comes back to, right, what does a company do? How do they do it? What's the sustainability of that over the next three, four, five years? Excellent. Great. And now we're going to do one more question for each of you before we jump to uh, the general Q&A session. John, I'll start with you. Uh, I think it's kind of crazy to start talking about the midterms already, but I know that it's in a lot of people's minds. We know historically the party in power tends to lose seats with razor thin majorities uh, in the House and really 50-50 in the Senate. How do you see the prospects for Democrats going into the midterms? And the second question to this is is Biden a one term president either by choice or uh, because he gets voted out? Let's say we'll start with. Go ahead. Well, in terms of the midterms, uh, yeah, for sure. The Democrats have a, a, a headwind. I mean, the historical headwind is uh, if you go back to, uh, uh, you know, Obama had both the House and the Senate by big margins. He lost the House two years later, lost the Senate four years after that. Uh, Clinton had the House and Senate by big margins, lost both of them. Two years later, Bush had the House and Senate by pretty good margins, didn't lose them in his first midterm, but that was right in the wake of 9-11. He did lose them four years later in 2006 after his reelection. So, um, uh, you know, history is uh, is sort of staring the Democrats in the face, particularly with uh, uh, these small margins they have. Beyond that, on the congressional side, you have redistricting and reapportionment. And that means every congressional seat is going to be redrawn. Some states are losing congressional seats. And the Republicans were smart as a party. They invested for a long time in local elections, particularly elections for state legislature. And in most states, it's the state legislatures that draw the district lines after a census. So we just last week had the new census numbers uh, distributed. And, uh, and, and let me just tell you, there, there's going to be every effort on the part of whoever's drawing those numbers to make it a little more advantageous to the party in, in that state, which, as I said, in most states, it's going to be Republicans. So um, that's another headwind that the Democrats have to deal with. Now, what they're hoping, what they're banking on, is that with Biden's approval ratings, with the popularities of the plans that he has uh, uh, put forth, uh, with his sort of uh, non-polarizing personality uh, that, uh, and with the reality that we are, the economy is for sure going to have a tailwind going into 2022, uh, both because COVID's, you know, coming to an end, hopefully. Uh, the vaccinations have gotten out there and will continue to get out there. The economy is reopening. And you got this massive fiscal stimulus that in all likelihood, maybe not as much as he would like, but at some level is going to continue uh, through the course of this year and well into 2022. Uh, what they're hoping is that they can beat history uh, because people will be saying, hey, things are actually going pretty well. And uh, and we like what these guys are doing. So uh, that remains to be seen. But I'll, I'll tell you, the Republicans are sharpening the knives, uh, getting ready for that midterm election. Now, in terms of Joe Biden, I think voluntarily he does run for a second term. He does not he said he intends to. He does not want to be considered a lame duck, particularly this early in his presidency. Um, he seems to have the energy uh, and uh, uh, and all. So I, I think he probably does run for a second term. Whether he wins or loses, um, don't bet on him losing if the Democrats lose in 2022. A lot of people would say, oh, you know, well, Biden's going to be out. This was terrible. Clinton got shellacked in, in the midterm. He won reelection. Uh, Obama got shellacked in the midterm. He won re-election. So 
Uh, so you can't really tell. And, and, you know, Americans tend to like divided government. So you could almost make an argument that if they lose one or both seats in the House or uh, I'm sorry, Houses of Congress, um, that that would be an argument for a Biden reelection. Uh, so uh, that one really is too soon to tell. I'll tell you, I, I, I'll suggest I'll say that. Yeah, fair enough. I'm not going to hold you to that one. We'll talk four years <laughs> from now. Rob, so let's end with you. How are you positioning your portfolios, let's say, for the next you know, 12 months uh, out? I think it's so important for investors everywhere, all around the world, just to lengthen their time horizon and not to fall into the penultimate preparedness trap, right? So that trap where um, you know the most decorated generals, as a, for instance, are always preparing to fight the war they just fought versus the, the next one. So coming out of the pandemic, I think two things that were a surprise for most professional money managers, at least my, myself. One was the extent of monetary, monetary policy, particularly taking real interest rates into negative territory where they still are today. And then two, uh, the speed and efficaciousness of, of the vaccines. So all of that led to what you saw over the last nine to 10 months, which was a massive uh, rally in risk markets, right? Credit spreads are now uh, back to not just pre-pandemic levels, but they're actually through that. The U.S. equity market from the pandemic low 12 months forward returned almost 80%. I went back and looked to see how many times that has happened. And as far back as I could go, which was 140 years, it's only happened five times. And interestingly, that was right after uh, the Great Depression and the announcement of FDR New Deal. And then of course we were back in a recession a, a few years later from that. So I guess my, my overarching point is just be careful not to chase the tape, right? So what has happened is typically not a good indicator of what will happen. The market has pulled forward massive economic strength. The market has pulled forward massive profit strength. All of that was largely stimulus driven. That is unsustainable. So when the government transfer payments wear off, when the unemployment benefits wear off, when the rent forbearance wears off, when negative real rates go from uh, negative 70, 80 basis points where they are today generally to something above zero, I think you have a very different uh, fundamental climate, a very different profit climate, and uh, a very different uh, valuation climate that investors are, are willing to pay for that. So be careful hanging on to what just happened and just stop, take a deep breath, and let's just think what's going to happen over the next three, four, five years. Thank you very much, uh, John and Rob. We have a few questions from the audience, and I'm afraid most of them um, are over the same topic, which is Latin America. As uh, you know, in fan society, we have uh, a lot of audience in, in Mexico, Chile, Uruguay, Argentina. Um, and in general, uh, they have questions about how um, Biden's administration has a different relationship with uh, Latin America than the previous administration. Um, specifically, they are asking us about immigration and about um, commodities, as um, quite a lot of the Latin American countries are uh, very heavy in, in some of those commodities. Their economy are very, are very um, um, reliant on commodities. Uh, so maybe, John, you can start talking a, a little bit about the immigration policies and then we can go into the investment implications with, with Rob. John, please. Okay, well, thank you very much. Those are, uh, those are important questions. Uh, I, I think a, a couple of things in terms of, um, uh, from a foreign policy standpoint of uh, uh, dealing with Latin America, and we, we haven't seen all of uh, President Biden's appointees yet, uh, as it relates to Latin America. Certainly some of the ambassadors have not yet been named. There's some talk of a uh, uh, fairly substantial uh, naming of an ambassador to, um, uh, to Mexico, for instance. Uh, but what we have seen is the fact that he put his vice president in charge of immigration. Now, that doesn't mean that he's asked her, and this is the first major assignment that he's given her, apart from being 
his advisor and the last person in the room when decisions are made and all that. Uh, it doesn't mean she's the one who's supposed to stop what's happening at the border. What it means is she is supposed to go south of the border and work with um, uh, communities in, uh, uh, in the, the countries that are uh, generating much of the uh, northbound pressure in terms of immigration uh, to try to uh, improve the situations in those countries, improve the economies, because nobody just picks up and decides to move their family at great personal risk, uh, at great risk to their children, even to send their children by themselves to a strange land where they don't know very many people, if anybody, and don't speak the same language because everything's going great at home. So if you truly want to uh, address immigration and the pressures of immigration, you need to work almost with a, and nobody in the administration's used this phrase, but I would say almost a Marshall Fund kind of plan to try to help uh, the countries, particularly in um, uh, in Central America and uh, uh, that are bringing so much of this pressure there. The second part of immigration, though, is a recognition uh, that the Biden administration has, and I don't think the Trump administration did so much, but a recognition that, uh, you know, uh, the reason the United States of America has had such a successful economy for so long is our immigrant culture. And um, not just people coming in as workers, but people coming in often with nothing or with little who end up founding companies that become some of our largest and most successful companies. And, uh, uh, you know, you just uh, uh, there's example after example after example of that. And also in many of our companies, particularly in the tech area, uh, there's a desire to uh, recruit people from uh, uh, you know, uh, other countries other than the United States to come in and um, uh, and and work in those jobs. That one another area that I think Latin. So that is going to relax the the idea of uh, of bringing in talented individuals uh, to to our country. And um, uh, the other uh, area is in the whole question of China, Asia, and uh, supply chains. I think as there is greater pressure. Uh, on the relationship with China. And I think as there is greater concern as a consequence of the pandemic and some other things with our supply chains, you may well see a repurposing of supply chains uh, to take advantage of, of some of the skills and talent of people in Latin America. So I think that's, a, uh, that's an area of, of opportunity. And, you know, on commodities, uh, I'll leave that to Rob. You know, my sense is that's really going to be less a function of Biden administration policy and more a function of what's happening in the larger global economy. Thank you. So Rob, can you can you add your thoughts about this? Yeah, sure. Um, no, I think John's absolutely right. Uh, the commodity prices are a function of what's going on all around us, and it's largely a function of supply and demand. So I'll go back to my earlier comments, right? The market is smart, but it's short term. So it's recognizing the inflationary pressures based uh, given by uh, all the vaccines, economies reopening, massive amounts of, of stimulus, uh, the rise because of uh, bottlenecks. Uh, whether it's bottlenecks due to uh, semiconductors or excess demand for uh, going on vacation, automobiles and all those sorts of things, all that's driving um, what you're seeing in commodity prices. And all that is, of course, beneficial to emerging markets, like you mentioned. So right now, the positive catalyst for EM, it's uh, high growth, high commodity prices juxtaposed against uh, low nominal rates and low real rates. All of that's a, a perfect backdrop for emerging markets. But I think, again, what's really important, though, is let's look beyond that. Let's look beyond the stimulus packages. Let's look beyond when we're at a more normal um, or, or let's call it post herd immunity world. And what will the uh, money velocity be? What will the economic backdrop be? And those secular forces, I think, still come come back on. For me, the um, the bullishness for emerging markets, it's, it's less about the economic backdrop. It's more about the changing constitution of the universe. So I, to me, emerging markets looks a lot like the United States uh, 100 or 150 years ago. So 100, 150 years ago, uh, U.S. equity stocks were railroads, uh, industrial companies, um, high capital intent, low margin, high GDP dependency. You had massive swings in margin and profitability based on uh, what 
economic velocity uh, was doing. And that's been EM for many, many years. But you've seen a significant transition over the last decade plus to more intellectual property. So a shift from capital intense businesses to low capital intense, high intellectual property. So in other words, moving the indices are less cyclically oriented than they were before, so less beneficiaries of high commodity prices and the like, and more towards cash flow compounders uh, or secular growth names. Now, that's in its infancy, but to me, that's the long-term bullish story for emerging markets on both the asset class and why I think stock selection and bond selection will be so critical in that universe. Great, we have a follow-up question for you, Rob, and it is um, about the US dollar. What do you think will happen with the US dollar and what will its effect be on the emerging markets? Oh, it's a shame we're ending on what could be the hardest uh, question to answer, uh, which is FX. Um, you know, ultimately interest rates are, a, uh, excuse me, FX is a function of rates. Rates are a function of GDP, which is a function of population spend and, and, and productivity. And so you know, looking out what will the dollar be in three, four or five years, uh, you know, my view is as good or as bad as anybody else's, um, at least how we try to incorporate that uh, into company analysis, just like we would other things that are really hard to predict or hard to underwrite, whether it's uh, interest rates or commodity prices, is just normalize it. So um, given various scenarios that the dollar is up 10% or down 10%, how is it going to impact uh, this company's revenue in their translation into profit. So I'm not giving you uh, the answer you want, but that's how we think about it. Okay, great. And now one last question for both of you. Uh, we have um, someone from the audience that is asking us, what is it that we are missing in our middle term view of the markets in relationship with this new administration. We've talked about a lot of things, but uh, do any of you have uh, something in mind that we have not talked about and that we should be uh, looking into? Uh, John, please. Well, I, first of all, I couldn't agree with Rob more that what we need to be thinking about is not so much what happened yesterday or even what's happening today, but what's going to happen tomorrow as we move into uh, the new more normal or the post COVID world. Uh, so I think it's easy to miss that, uh, you know, winners today may not be the winners tomorrow. And, uh, uh, it, but, but by the same token, there are a lot of companies that have grown very, very strong during this period of time, which means barriers to entry to some of those industries will be tougher. So we should think about that. I think that the one thing that we haven't talked about that we should think about is cyber and cyber vulnerabilities, whether it's our financial systems, our air traffic control systems, uh, our obviously intelligence and governmental systems, or just the ability to hack and embarrass the way, you know, we saw North Korea do with Sony Pictures, uh, you know, when it came to the fact that Sony made that movie they didn't like. So, um, uh, but, but this is one of those things that rarely gets talked about or raised in in conversations and uh and it's just sitting out there as a great big old uh hairy uh vulnerability and uh i think it's a vulnerability for a lot of companies and it's a vulnerability for countries and for the west particularly you know the west tends to be open um some of our adversaries you know china russia north korea um are much more effective on the they're very effective on the uh, sort of the point of the spear, the aggressive part of cyber. And we've got to not only uh, get our defenses up, but we also have to get pretty good on that front. So we at least can get to a mutually assured destruction thing. And that doesn't take into account non-state actors uh, who are also out there. So I, I would just say that's the one thing I worry about a little bit that, uh, that we didn't talk about today. Great. Rob? Mine is market structure. Uh, for most of our careers, it used to be a stock market. Um, think back to your training, whether it was uh, at university or in business school or maybe preparing for the chartered financial uh, analyst examination. You're taught to underwrite what does the business do 
how do they do it, right? What's their cost of capital? What will be those future cash flows? Discount that back. So you're taught how to compare, or how to analyze and compare investment opportunity A versus investment opportunity B. And technology um, has democratized information, like I mentioned before, but it's also democratized investing. And that's a good thing because it's, uh, allowed new entrants into the marketplace. It's made investing more affordable. It's lowered costs. And so all of that's positive. But what it's done is we went from a stock market to a market of stocks. So now um, volume is dictated by uh, basketized trading, right? So it's large machines or large investors trading baskets of stocks. So somewhere along the way we, we we shifted from a world of underwriting again what does this company do and, and what's its purpose and and its sustainability and cash flows to growth value us non-us large cap small cap high grade high yield developed market developing at the end of the day it's all the same thing it's all risk right it all has a correlation of one ultimately what matters is what will future cash flows be and so there is no valuation support to an asset that doesn't have future cash flow so i think what you saw in february and march you know the market was down 30 percent in three weeks and you can blame it on the pandemic and the liquidity crunch i'll blame a big part of it just on a change in market structure and so volatility happens when assumptions are proven false. And so I think just looking out ahead, we need to uh, be really thoughtful about how we're positioned and what we own and does it have future cash flow power like the market uh, expects? Because if it doesn't, you will not have time to get out of that tidal wave. I think February and March showed you that. And so I guess what I worry about is all those new investors that have come into the market in the last 10 to 15 years that have never experienced a world where um, uh, central banks don't control prices and don't control or, or, or dampen volatility. And so I, I worry about those things. So now uh, I would like to invite Ahmed to answer this question, if, if you may. You, what yeah. do you think about, what are the risks there? Yeah, I think I think possibly I think geopolitical risk is not being adequately accounted for in the market right now. I do think at some point between now and the midterm elections, um, a, a state actor is going to challenge the Biden administration somewhere. Uh, perhaps John is right in the fact that Taiwan is is too important, so to speak. Right, it's eighty percent of the manufacturing capability of semiconductors in the world. Uh, so that's perhaps too big, but somewhere else, whether it be in the South China Sea, uh, uh, possibly in the Ukraine with Russia. So there's with Iran in the Middle East, I think somewhere along the way, and we don't know exactly where, but the administration's resolve and, and, and it's really not just the administration's resolve that they're testing. They're testing the country's resolve. I think that there's certainly been a relative power decline of the United States vis-a-vis -vis other parts of the globe, simply a matter of economics, right? A sort of return to normal, let's say, a more normal economic state, right? We are no longer 40% of global GDP like how we were after the end of World War II. So I think you're seeing these up and coming powers are going to be further testing the country. And I think potentially in a run up to the midterm elections is a place where they could potentially try that. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, John, Rob, and Ahmed for joining us today. It has been very interesting and I think has been very useful for our audience. Um, and well, have, have a great uh, afternoon or evening in Europe. And uh, I hope to see you, all of you soon with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.